Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session on photo injection and mutations. So we will have uh, three long talks, having 15 minutes each, and then another five short talks, for about the seven to eight minutes each. Yeah, feel free to ask questions after each of the presenters' presentations. And my name is Lin Xiao. I'm, uh, I'm from the Singapore Management University. I'm mostly working on automated testing, debugging, uh, program analysis, and then recently more deep learning of a software code analysis as well. So yeah, okay. Without further ado, let's welcome the first speaker, uh, Yu Gao, from the Institute of Software, Chinese Academy of Science. And then, okay, you can take the stage. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. I'm pleased to introduce, uh, oh, my name is Yu Gao, <laughs> and I'm very pleased to introduce our work, Courage Guided Photo Injection for Cloud Systems. Uh, Large-scale cloud systems usually consist of thousands of nodes and involve complex protocols and implementations. Nodes in cloud systems depend on I.O. operations to produce persistent states or store states into other nodes. Node crashes and reboots are inevitable in cloud systems. Any node can crash or reboot at any time. These node crashes and reboots can result in specific crash states. When node crashes or reboot, it will trigger the corresponding recovery procedures, which are responsible for handling the fault and recovering the cloud system to a normal state. As shown in the finger, when node A crashes before sending a heartbeat message to node B, B will remove A from its node list. When node A crashes after submitting a task, B will make another node C take over A's task. Both of these two crash scenarios can be tolerated by the cloud system. However, node crashes and reboots that occur other special timing can trigger crash, uh, can, uh, that occur other special timing can trigger crash recovery bugs hidden in incorrect crash recovery mechanisms and the implementations. For example, the crash scenario shown in the finger can make the cloud system fail to recover the task due to a crash recovery bug. Crash recovery bugs can cause severe consequences and impact the reliability and availability of cloud systems. To test the correctness of cloud systems in how they deal with node crashes and reboots, an intuitive approach is to systematically exercise all possible crash scenarios and observe whether a cloud system can correctly recover from these crash scenarios. However, it's challenging to systematically explore the crash scenario space of cloud systems. In our experiments, a HDFS system with five nodes can produce around 400 I.O. operations for each node. When injecting only one node crash or the I.O. points, we can produce 2,000 crash scenarios. When injecting two crashes or the I.O. points from two different nodes, we can produce around 1.6 million crash scenarios. Uh, when we further consider no more node crashes and even node reboots, the number of possible crash scenarios could increase quickly. Uh, therefore, testing cloud systems by enumerating all possible crash scenarios is time consuming and may be impossible. We also observe that some crash scenarios may trigger the same recovery code and can be tolerated by the cloud system. As shown in the figures, as there are three heartbeat messages and the false, uh, the crashes, the node crashes before, these, before setting these three heartbeat messages can result in the same recovery code that is B removes A from uh, its node list. Such crash scenarios suppose challenges for effectively exploring crash scenario space or cloud systems. A lot of works have been proposed to test the correctness of cloud systems in dealing with faults. Random fault injection frameworks uh, inject node crashes randomly but they are hard to hit corner case crash recovery bugs. Exhaustive for the injection approaches and the distributed system model checkers are not effective in exploring the huge space of crash scenarios. Some approaches rely on the cloud system developers to decide the fault injection strategies and other approaches only focus on limited crash scenarios. Considering the limitations of existing works, we wonder, can we systematically and effectively explore the crash scenario space of cloud systems? 
in this work, we propose crash fast a novel approach uh, to achieve this goal. Our basic idea is using uh, is using photo sequences to represent uh, various crash scenarios. A photo sequence contains all the IO points executed in a system run, and they are called responding events, including node crash event, node reboot event, and photo free event. We take a photo sequence as a special system input and adjust the photo sequences according to the system feedbacks based on our photo sequence generation mutation and selection strategies. We can guide a cloud system to cover new crash recovery code and increase the chance of triggering crash recovery bugs. Uh, so here you see we first run the target cloud system and collect the runtime information through instrument, instrumenting the system. Based on all the collected information, for example, coverage and IO information, we generate and mutate fault sequences and add them to a queue. And we then select a fault sequence from the queue based on a series of selection strategies. During fault injection testing, we will run the target system again and inject node crashes and the reboots according to the fault sequence at the test. And during and after the fault injection testing, we use predefined checkers to detect failure symptoms and detect crash recovery bugs. The failure symptoms include error entries in execution logs, expected node downtime, and so on. Uh, in this pre presentation, I will only focus on the fault sequence generation mutation and the selection parts which have made contributions of our work. After the initial run of the target system, we can obtain all the executed IO points and generate an uh, initial fault sequence that uh, does not contain any faults. As shown in the finger, we can get an initial fault sequence which contains the four IO points from three nodes. <coughs> we then crash an IO point in the fault sequence to generate a, a group of new fault sequences. In this example, we can generate four new fault sequences. For the specific sequence runs, after a fault injection test, we keep the fault sequences that increase the code coverage. For such fault sequences, we first create corresponding new fault sequences based on the collected IO points and the injected faults. The created fault sequences reflect the actual execution behaviors. For example, after a fault injection test, some IO points could disappear due to the injected faults and some IO points could be executed by the recovery procedures. Based on the creating a new IO, uh, new fault sequences, we can mutate it to generate a group of new fault sequences uh, by only adding a node crash or reboot to the sequence. We make sure the newly injected fault satisfies some constraints, that is, only allowing nodes can crash, can crash, only dead nodes can be rebooted, system specific constraints and user specified constraints. Therefore, we can generate valid fault sequences that can be executed by the cloud system. Let me show a counter example here. In this fault sequence, node B has already been crashed. That injecting a new fault sequence, a new fault to crash a node B again does not satisfy the constraints. To effectively explore fault sequences in the queue, we first apply a series of prioritization strategies to get a group of suspicious fault sequences as candidates. Then we compute a priority score for every candidate fault sequence and randomly pick a fault sequence from the candidate to test based on their priority scores. First, we prioritize the fault sequence that inject faults or new IO points. This is because the false or tested IO points are brought to cover the executed recovery code, while the false or new IO points are more likely to trigger new code. We also prioritize the fault sequences that inject faults uh, or IO points occurring during recovery, as shown in the figure. When we crash node A before sending a message X, new IO points will be executed during the recovery process. We prioritize such, I, uh, such uh, we prioritize the faults occurring on such IO points. This is because such uh, such faults are prone to complicate the recovery process and trigger bugs, according to our previously empirical study of crash recovery bugs. For the selected candidate fault sequences, we compute a priority score for each of them by considering some metrics such as execution time, code coverage, and the number of faults. 
The priority scores are used to accelerate the testing process and test the crash scenarios with multiple node crashes and reboots faster. We evaluate our approach all three popular cloud, cloud systems and compare it with three alternative approaches. And we run the target system at most 48 hours and set the maximum number of faults in a fault sequence as 10. In total, crash fast had detected four new bugs and one new bug. Two of them can be detected by the alternative approaches. We also measure crash fast's effectiveness in testing recovery behaviors of cloud systems through the overall code coverage. As shown in the figure, crash fast can cover the most code and achieve higher code coverage faster compared with alternative approaches. In conclusion, cloud systems must correctly recover from node crashes and reboots. We propose a novel approach crash fast to systematically and effectively explore the huge crash scenario space of cloud scenarios. Our approach is available on GitHub. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's very in time, so we have a yeah, question. Thank you for the very nice talk. So uh, I had a question about the kinds of faults you can inject with the tool. So it looks like you're focusing on crashes, uh, mm -hmm. crash causing faults, and also node reboots, right? Is that correct? We only focus so, so you're on looking at crash causing faults and node reboots. Is that yes, right? yes. So how extensible would this be if I wanted to inject things like silent data corruptions or you know Byzantine faults or things that go beyond just crashes? Mm, sorry, I. So can I extend your tool to inject faults beyond just those that cause crashes or node reboots? Oh. Yeah. What, do you consider any? Kind of, uh, errors, or you just focus oh, on I trust. In this work, we just focus on node crashes and the reboots, and uh, we expect to add more faults in the future work. So, so will your heuristics be applicable to things like Byzantine faults, for example, where you cut up some data and then, what, you know, what what happens? Would, would the same heuristics apply? Do you think? I'm sorry. Okay, never mind. I can take that. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering uh, what is the code covered more by the test case? So, I mean, let's say you have a test case and you're uh, generating some mutated versions. So, um, what is the increased code coverage? Is it in the exception handling or for recovery from, uh, from a fault? So what portions of the code was additionally covered by your tests? Do you mean the increased code coverage is the increased code coverage is caused by the recovery behaviors? Mm -hmm. and, uh, actually, uh, in more code coverage is not, uh, uh, the increased code coverage uh, may not caused by the recovery behaviors. <laughs> Uh, so you can say we use the overall code coverage, uh, but uh, uh, but in our experiments, the increased uh, code coverage are more likely to be tra uh, triggered by the node crashes and the reboots because uh, we use uh, we use the same workload for all the fault injection tests. So the additional code covered is related to recovering from a fault or handling some faults. So those kinds of uh, codes are covered more. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question about your user specified the constraints. How, oh. how does this constraint look like? How generalizable are those constraints? Do you have any examples to um, share? Uh, I can use for the user specif uh, specified constraints. We only use uh, the number of faults in a fault sequence does not exceed uh, exceed the number uh, of maximum faults specified by the user. 
that is the user specified constraints. And for system specific constraints, actually we make sure that uh, the generated crash scenarios can be tolerated by the uh, cloud system. For example, we do not generate crash scenarios that will fill the whole cluster. Okay. Yeah. By the way, how many, how, how large are the clusters you have been experimenting with? How many um, nodes are you using? Five nodes. Five nodes, okay. Yeah. Do you think it will be generalizable to larger cluster, or you need to use um, a different heuristics? To uh, actually, if you heuristics? have a larger uh, uh, larger cluster, uh, it will produce more I/O operations, and thus yeah, uh, so it will easy. increase the crash scenario space. But uh, based on our, all our observations, the increased I/O operations are more likely to be appeared in a small scale cluster. And uh, based on all our previous study of crash recovery bugs, uh, we can trigger most of all crash recovery bugs uh, uh, in a cluster with no more than five nodes. So we think it's reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Hello, welcome to this presentation. I'm Chong Kim from Korea University. I will present this work, Diver Oracle Guided SMT Server Testing with Unrestricted Random Mutation. This work was collaborated with Sun Bam So and Hak Ju Oh. Uh, as you all may know, an SMT Server is a software for deciding the satisfiability of the formula in first order logic. In this slide, you can see a simple example of how SMT server works. If there exists exist an assignment which makes the given formula true, the SMT server returns the set with a model. These SMT servers are used as a keystone of many software engineering tools, such as program verification, simple execution, and program repair, and program synthesis. Suddenly, recent SMT servers are large and highly complex software. Therefore, many types of bugs inevitably exist in this software. This existence of bugs is threatening the reliability and robustness of a wide range of tools based on SMT server, which means that the correctness of SMT server is very important. In this work, we aim to find bugs in SMT servers. Specifically, we focus on two types of bugs, reputational soundness and embedded model bug. Reputational soundness bug is caused when the server incorrectly returns set formula as unset. Meanwhile, embedded model bug is that the server produces unsatisfying model. These bugs are critical in the sense that each bug can lead the SMT servers to output wrong verification results in program verification and unintended test cases in symbol rig execution. But finding these bugs is not simple. It is because that they can be identified only when we know the formula is satisfiable. This challenge is called a test oracle problem. This slide shows a simple example illustrating this problem. CV5 returns onset for this given formula, but we cannot check whether this result is true or not. To overcome this challenge, many works have been introduced. <clears throat> and these works can be classified to main branches, which are known as differential testing and oracle guided testing. Differential testing can use multiple servers to cross-check the result. And oracle-guided testing relies on predefined and restricted mutation rules to generate the result you already know. But it has its own limitation. First, differential testing is not applicable when the cross-checking with multiple servers is not available. Let's start off, let's start off with an example. In this slide, a satisfiable formula is given. Let's assume that we are generating a mutant formula by replacing lines 5 and 6. This mutant formula is satisfiable when the variable t has a value of a string negative 0. But CV5 returns wrong result on set about given mutant formula. 
when we are using a G3 solver to cross-check the formula, it unfortunately returns an error. It is because the function calls at stair.update is a specific function used only in C plus 5. Results cannot be compared. So therefore, this reputational soundness box cannot be identified by using differential testing. On the other hand, existing Oracle Guide testing has limitations to generate diverse returns, as it requires certain rules which must preserve the semantics of the returns and the original. It, however, is very impossible for the existing techniques to find such returns, like the line 5 prime and 6 prime, the green highlighted lines. The reason for this is that the logical meaning of terms in, is totally different. For example, there is no relation between term in line 5 and term in line 6. Likewise, it is difficult to introduce a new function like a str.update. In short, existing approaches still have limitations even though they are useful for finding bugs in SMT servers. To complement those shortcomings of existing approaches, we present a novel technique called Diver for testing SMT server. The main feature of Diver is that it can fully enjoy the strengths of the Oracle guided technique, yet it is allowed unrestricted mutations which the existing Oracle guided technique cannot handle. Our key idea for this is using a SO Oracle, which means that we find the mutant satisfying the original seed model. I will explain this idea with a simple example on this slide. Uh, given a seed formula and its model, our goal is to find the mutant formulas satisfying model M by mutating the seed formula. Initially, the seed formula is randomly mutated. In this case, the power of the, the, the term of power is used for replacing the constant 2, this mutant formula satisfies the original model M. In more detail, because each subtom of mutant is evaluated as true against model M, we can use this mutant for testing SMT server. In other case, a term of plus is used to replace the constant 0, this mutant formula fails to satisfy the original model M. Because the left subtom of for mutant is evaluate pulse against the M. Hence, we don't use this mutant as a test case. Similarly, this mutant test satisfies the model and we can use it as a test case. In this way, Diver can generate diverse mutants without differential testing, unlike to the existing approaches. To show effectiveness of Diver in an aspect of bug finding ability, we use Diver to test recent version of three SMT servers during four to five months. As a result, Diver was able to find 25 new bugs and 21 bugs among them were critical bugs which we initially targeted, reputational soundness and invalid model bug. Moreover, we also received the positive comments from the developers. For example, the developers confirmed that the root cause of the bugs we reported was actually related to the unsoundness of the lemma used in string server. This lemma has been used for two years, but no one has recognized this problem. After we reported this issue, the problem was fixed. To show that the diver successfully complement of the shortcomings of existing approaches, we conducted comparison experiments with existing tools. We used two differential tests based testing tools and three oracle guided tools. The benchmarks are 25 bucks found by diver and we set timeout for one hour each benchmark. We repeated the experiments 30 times considering internal randomness of existing tools. As a result, the existing tools collectively detect only seven out of 25 and three oracle guided tools five found 3 out of 25. Two differential testing tools found 4 out of 25.
To summarize my talk, I presented diverse new oracle guided puzzle with uh, unrestricted random mutations for testing SMT server. Diver found 25 new bugs in three SMT servers, while existing tools managed to find only seven of them. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? <coughs> Hi, um, thank you. That that was interesting. We we use Z3 in some of our work, so good to know there's some more bugs in it. Um, I'm curious, what is the character of the bugs that you found? Like, probably basic addition was not a kind of bug that you found related to basic addition. Were they, you know, really obscure edge cases that most users wouldn't encounter? Mm, I think uh, there is a uh, edge case of bug. Uh, Edge case, mm -hmm. but um, oh yeah, yeah. I can come talk to you later. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious, it seems your study focused on the case when the solver returns unsatisfiable results for actually original satisfiable formula, right? Yeah. How about the reverse? If the original formula is unsatisfiable, is there any case you found that the solver returns satisfiable? Yeah, uh, it, it, it is by at least our work of limita limitation of our work. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you think any possibility to utilize some random mutation to somehow use similar idea to apply to that case mm, as well? This case, uh, this box cannot use a model because mm -hmm. the formula is must be set uh, unsatisfiable. So, in our in our basic idea is used model, so it is hard to uh, uh, handle this box. Yeah. Okay. So the key thing is the model. Uh, like yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. And also there's uh, many mutations, right? In the, in the literature, there's different kind of mutation to the constraints. Yeah. Why do you choose to use random mutation? Or try to in improve the unrestricted random mutation, ah, right? Okay. Well, Oh. Maybe some kind of a constraint on the mutation, maybe even can tailor the detection for certain kind of bugs? Oh, it is just, oh, yeah, I, I understood your question. Uh, yeah, oh, it may, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 uh, okay. Sure. Uh, maybe ask yeah, uh, yeah. another way. So, what kind of other mutation do you know in the literature that can maybe complement your 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 approach? Oh, our approach is can I, I can mutate all yes. terms in formulas. Right. Yeah. Uh, or any other particular kind of mutations to the constraints you specified? Oh, sorry, I, I understand your point. Okay, understand, yeah. okay. Yes. We can probably t talk more afterwards. Yeah, 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 yes. talk. thank you. Any other questions from the audience? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Okay. Thank you. The slide is quite nice. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you all here. My name is Yoji from Sony. I'd like to start by talking about this title. First of all, let me explain what defect injection risks are. There are potential risks of defects that might be injected in subsequent development activities. Among them, we newly defined risks that indicate behavior and structure in diagrams as a defect injection risk. DIRs need careful implementation and validation in subsequent development activities. Moreover, DIRs can be pre predicted from diagrams 
but are not defects in the diagrams at the point of analysis and design activities. Let me explain it with this figure. Wait, okay. This figure shows an example of a DIR injected during the development activities. Firstly, a sequence diagram representing a message between objects in design. Secondly, the system configuration representing the message between objects in different computers joined by an unstable network connection is defined. Lastly, programmers uh, implement product code based on the sequence diagram. At that time, the sequence diagram doesn't include a defect for missing resend and timeout as of A because detailed implementations are determined as of B. Nevertheless, its defect, its, its defect is injected into the product code as of C. Of course, if objects are allocated on the same computers, no resend and timeout is required to implement. It means that even if the sequence diagram is correct, the programmers may have to pay attention to implementation depending on subsequent, subsequent activities after designing it. We expect various effects by identifying and dealing with DIRs. We can prevent def defects ahead of happening in subsequent development. As a result, there is an elimination of the rework effort to correct defects might be injected in subsequent development activities. Nevertheless, there aren't many studies on this topic. Using FMEA and HAZOP, some studies have proposed methods to detect risks of security, safety, and reliability from UML diagrams. Although these methods can detect DIRs, the risks are limited to safety and security domains. Thereby, no studies refer to the identification of general effort effective DIRs. Accordingly, we set the goal of generalizing effort effective DIRs using diagrams without the limitation of focusing on specific areas, including safety or security. Afterward, we set two research questions so as to realize the goal. The first is, can DIRs be identified and generalized from analysis and design diagrams? The second is, are DIRs applicable to, un, applicable to other analysis and design diagrams? Oh, sorry. We conducted analysis in the following order to solve the research questions. Firstly, we identified and generalized defect patterns from defect repositories. We narrowed down the defects to the ones that require large work efforts. Secondary, we generalize defect patterns as DIRs using the diagrams and their elements. Subsequently, we evaluated whether the DIRs applied to the, applied to the diagrams of products in development at Sony. Lastly, we evaluated whether the DIRs applied to diagrams available in public as well. I'm explaining details of each procedure in the following slides. In procedure 1-1, we identified defect patterns using ODC in, def in defects for each product in Sony. At ODC analysis, we used ODC attribute, defect type, and record item component. Moreover, we selected defects using the record item in the defect repositories. It means <coughs> defects were narrowed down to those injected after requirement analysis and detected at system testing. Regarding procedure 1-2, we generalized the defect patterns as a DIR. 
with the following definition. DIR consists of D, T, and U. D denotes the description of DIR. T denotes the type of, types of diagram. And U denotes the occurrence conditions of elements in the diagrams. Afterward, we conducted two kinds of error. <laughs> two kinds of evaluation for the DIRs. One, one evaluated whether the DIRs were applicable to three products in development at Sony. The other evaluated whether the DIRs were applicable to five publicly available diagrams. Each table shows the products used in each evaluation. Next, let me explain the results of each, an each analysis procedure. <clears throat> in procedure 1-1, 11 defect patterns were identified. Afterward, we selected three of them with the largest number of applicable products. Defect patterns D1 and D2 were found in six products, and D3 was found for, were found in four products. In procedure 1-2, we generalize the defect patterns as DIRs. In this presentation, we focused on DIR I1. I1 is a DIR representing insufficient implementation to prevent data access confliction. It can be identified from the combination of use case, sequence, and cross diagram. This figure shows the occurrence condition of I1. Use cases U1 and U2 can be concurrently executed. Message M1 is sent to object O1 in sequence diagram S1. Message M2 is sent to object O2 in, in the sequence diagram, diagram S2. And cross diagram defines the relationship between objects O1 and O2. Please refer to our paper for the <coughs> complete definition of DIRs and examples. In the next slide, let me explain the results of the evaluations. In evaluation with diagrams developed at Sony, all DIRs were applicable to all products except for I3 in product 2-1-1. In evaluation with publicly available diagrams, I1 and I3 were applicable to all products except for product 2-2-2. I2 was applicable to all products. DIRs have a larger, larger impact on the correction effort because the DIRs were identified from defects detected in system testing. Additionally, the effort for considering such risks should be small compared to existing comprehensive risk detection methods because our risks don't always require exhaustive validation as described in occurrence conditions. As a conclusion, we've decided to start to study two key factors. One is defining a procedure to identify DIRs so as to automatically identify them. The other is a stability definition for DIRs in order to automatically prioritize identified, identified DIRs. Cons consequently, we expect to establish a development style that enables continuous improvement of software quality. This is a summary, but I'll skip this. That's all, thank you for listening. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Okay. I'm just curious, the mm -hmm. pattern, defect patterns you define, right, seems generic to different kind of domains. Do you have a specific uh, application domain mm -hmm. in Sony or specific uh, kind of uh, applications? 
sorry, I didn't catch what you said. Could you uh, say what, kind, what kind of application domain you are targeting? Uh, everything. But, everything. Yeah. But, uh, but based on your Sony experience, mm. uh, what? Okay, maybe that's uh, confidential information. Mm. But do you think uh, the patterns you defined really will be applicable to all kinds of uh, systems? Mm -hmm. Sorry, could you say that? Uh, do, do you mm -hmm. think the defect pattern you def mm -hmm. defined, right? The previous result, you showed the defect patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a generic to all kinds of uh, software systems. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, the, uh, the I one, the, mm -hmm. Can you show the slides, show mm -hmm. the results? What page? Oh, results for page? De okay. Defect patterns. Defect patterns, okay. Here. Yeah, the previous one. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So this, uh, this may, the, what kind of application you are targeting for by using this kind of definition for defect patterns? Mm, what kind of? All kinds of. Mm -hmm. uh, three or sorry, wait, this and three, four kinds of. Products. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, you have that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, more professional video camera, oh, so sorry. image mm -hmm. processing. Yes, yes. And consumer camera and security camera and medical. Okay, yeah. okay. thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Any other questions from the audience? So, for the defect pattern de definition, mm -hmm. right, it's really involved a lot of human studies, human mm -hmm. labelings. Uh, how did you label them? Do you have a multiple mm. authors working together to use some grounded theory to perform the labeling and definitions? Mm. Let's discuss with us right after this section. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So maybe you also mm -hmm. discussed among your authors to mm -hmm. label the results? Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, then that's all. Thank you very much, Yuji. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this is uh, a tool demonstration about uh, DAMAT, which is our uh, data-driven mutation analysis uh, tool. And uh, I'm Fabrizio Pastore from the University of Luxembourg. This is our joint work with Lionel and the others in, in the paper. Uh, so, this demo is based on the tutorial that we have available online uh, on uh, GitHub. And uh, it is, uh, the objective of uh, the demonstration is uh, to assess the test suite of uh, libcsp. In, uh, specifically, we want to be sure that uh, the, the test suite of this, uh, uh, this software uh, properly exercises the integration between its components. libcsp is uh, a software that uh, manages, is a library that manages the communication between the components of a CubeSat. It's developed by Gomespace, and which is our partner in a project with ESA. Uh, this uh, demonstration is about the DAMAT, which is a tool that, to perform what we call data-driven mutation analysis. It consists of uh, injecting some mutation probes in the communication layer uh, that, are, that is used by different uh, components. These uh, mutation probes, what they do is that during the execution of test cases, they alter the data that is uh, exchanged between the, the components. The way the data that is modified is controlled by fault models that are specified by software engineers. The fault models should be specified in such a way that uh, when there is a change, when there is a mutation that is performed by these mutation probes, you should observe a failure. Uh, for example, you specify a fault model in such a way that uh, you modify a certain data value with a data value that belongs to a different input partition. So in that way, you know that when a mutation is performed, basically the scenario that is executed is different than the scenario that is expected by the test case. So consequently, the test case should fail because the software is doing something else or it's observing uh, something else. Uh, what we do is to modify the data that is exchanged in components and to that uh, we target uh, uh, data structures, a specific data structure which is the, 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 a data buffer where normally the messages uh, are uh, serialized and in a data buffer basically you may have data items that spam 
over one or multiple units, and they represent different type of information. So basically, the row bytes should be interpreted in different ways. So this type of information is captured by our fault model specifications, which is, is basically a table where you specify in each row, you specify how to mutate a specific uh, data item, you indicate uh, the the type of the message that is targeted with the, using the name of the fault model, then the position of the data item and the type the, of uh, uh, that is used to interpret the data item, then you specify the mutation operator that you want to use and some parameters for this mutation operator. Uh, we have defined 12 mutation operators that you find in the paper. And then what happens is that after you define a fault model, uh, we automatically generate what we call a mutation API. Uh, it's basically, this is the output of, uh, of the tool. In the mutation API, you have uh, all the implementation of our uh, mutation operators plus two uh, mutation probes. These are basically functions that you have to introduce in the software under test in order to uh, have this mutation to be performed at runtime. This is the second step of the approach. You introduce this uh, invocation of the mutation probes. It's just a matter of one invocation for each fault model that you have. And so this is an example. For example, here we introduce uh, uh, a function call uh, in, the, in the function that is supposed to send the commands uh, to, the, to the server of this, uh, of this library, and one in the, uh, in the part that sends back the, the reading from the server to, to, to the client. So you modified in a couple of places your software under test and then you run our tool and what our tool does is that it generates a number of mutants, one for each mu mutator operator that was uh, uh, configured. And so you end up with a different number of, of mutants, each of them perform a specific modification to the data and you execute uh, and we execute automatically the test cases for all of these mutants. And this leads to our results. So this is uh, how you see, you run, you run the tool, you have uh, the compilation of the mutants, their execution, and in the end you have a, a number of, of metrics. Uh, we have three different metrics. The first one is the fault model coverage. It is basically the proportion of uh, fault models having uh, a mutation probe that was exercised at least once. Uh, since we define uh, a fault model for each message types, is, it corresponds to the percentage of message types that are exercised by the test suite. And this is very useful uh, when you need to assess a test suite for a large system because it enables the engineers basically to understand if all the message types were actually exercised during the, the execution of the test suite. Then the second one is the mutation operator coverage, which is basically the proportion of uh, mutants that were actually performing some mutation of, uh, of the data during the execution of the test suite. So since each mutant aim to replace a data value that belong, belongs to an input partition with a data value belonging to a different input partition, basically it captures the proportion of input partitions that are exercised by your test suite. And again, this is difficult to capture in a di not without our, different, our tool because uh, the system in large, uh, you are running uh, system test cases and you have no way to figure out if you really during the execution of the system all the import partitions were uh, exercised. And the last one is the mutation score, uh, which is basically the proportion of mutants that were uh, leading to, uh, to failures. And uh, it... Uh, uh, provides information about uh, the quality of the oracles because uh, you expect all the mutants to lead to, uh, to a failure. If the, it is not detected, then uh, you, you know, the test suite is not good. Uh, then there is also some detailed information. Basically, you can see uh, for each of the mutant uh, which, which are the mutants that are not uh, leading to good results. For example, this is a mutant that was not applied. Uh, it's a mutant that basically when it sees a value above a threshold, it replaces it with a, a value below the threshold. And in practice, it means since it was not applies, applied, it means that the test suite was not exercising the non-nominal cases and this is useful. So you can fix the test suite, you add a test case, you re-execute, and then you have a, a better uh, score. And this is the process that is explained in our tutorial. You find online our tool and you can try it by, your, by yourself. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your presentation. So uh, I have two questions. First, is libcsb the only library for uh, that uh, satellite intercommunication? 
Uh, LibCSP Lib is the library that... Uh, is it the only one, like, for satellite communication? No, it's not the only one. It's the, it's the one that they are using for nanosatellites. It is, so, it is uh, your tool, is it generalizable to other uh, libraries for intercommunication? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, LibCSP is the simpler case study and it's open source. So, the, this is why I am presenting it in the... Two for the demonstration, and uh, this is why we have it uh, in the tutorial, but we use it for uh, more complex systems with uh, several components. So, so we, your fault model is uh, basically a, a CSV file specification where you uh, specify the properties, you vary the properties. So is that an exhaustive combination of all properties? Uh, we have a methodology that is uh, explained in, uh, in a journal first paper and I cannot detail here, but basically what, what you do is that from uh, uh, the specification of your data model, you, there, you identify the different ways in which you can mutate your different data items and from that you derive this, uh, this specification. So it's complete, it, it depends on the engineer, uh, but uh, you, you should specify for each uh, data item uh, how, to, how to mutate it. Okay, so thank you so much for answering. And uh, I actually read this paper and really enjoyed reading it. It's one of the best papers I've read. Oh, thank thank you. you so much. Thank you. Very nice presentation, Fabrizio. Thank you. I'm a bit curious. Uh, you mentioned you are using this in the context of uh, CubeSats, and, and I'm curious about the realism of the fault models, because in CubeSats, as you know, people in general use uh, COTS hardware, and uh, because of the, of the radiation in the, in the lower orbit, you have single event upsets that exactly lead to data, uh, data flips and things like that. Are you using... Uh, any criteria related to induce some realism in the mutants or this is just mutation testing without any, any care about uh, whether you are really represented real faults or just doing testing? Yeah, so let's say that even if the tool can be used in principle for more traditional robustness testing, we are using it for mutation analysis, more traditional mutation analysis. So uh, our focus is more on uh, uh, the data model, if you, if you want. So we are not trying to replicate uh, those type of faults that in principle should be handled by the hardware. So, and we are using it also in a bigger project with a more with a, a micro satellite, which is larger, but has more component. But still, even in that case, we are relying more on, on the data model rather than on, on the radiation or that type of information. Thank you. That's great. Due to the time limitation, let's move on to the next speakers. So thank you very much, Fabio. So. Next. Well, hello, my name is Ana Belén Sánchez from the University of Seville, Spain, and I'm going to present the article with the title Mutation Testing in the Wild Findings from Gihad. This article was published in the Empirical Software Engineering Journal on July 18, 2022. Um, Mutation testing is a very popular uh, testing technique. Previous surveys on mutation testing all agree on the relevance of mutation testing in the research area, especially as a common methodology for evaluating the effectiveness of testing techniques. However, the overall impact of mutation testing beyond research is still limited, um, mostly unexplored. So to what extent is mutation testing adopted in practice? That's the question that motivates our work. These are the research questions of our work. Uh, what is the current tool support for mutation testing? Uh, to which extent is mutation testing adopted in practice? Uh, uh, which type of, pro of projects are mutation testing tools used for? And which is the activity and relevance uh, uh, of projects using mutation uh, tools? In order to try to answer this research question, we performed a deep process of data collection. This was performed in three steps. First, we performed a systematic search for mutation testing tools, a literature search and a GitHub search. Second, we conduct, conducted a systematic search for GitHub repositories, including evidence of use of those tools. Uh, this was an automated process using data mining. 
And third, we perform a through manual revisions and classification of more than 3,500 repositories found on GitHub. Among other findings, we would like to mention that by studying research question one, we can show the number of mutation tools released per year. So <clears throat> the trend of creation of new mutation tools started to increase in 2008, and 2018 was the most prolific year with three tools released. This figure illustrates the classification of mutation testing tools based on their target artifacts. Java is the predominant language, followed by C, C++, models, and specification languages, and finally, web related technologies. <coughs> this table uh, shows the top 10 most popular mutation testing tools based on the number of GitHub repositories, including evidence of uh, their use. Um, this part addresses research question two uh, by studying the number and general features of the eHub repositories, including evidence of use of the 10 mutation testing tools under study, those found in a larger number of repositories. Regarding the number of active repositories, infection is by far uh, the most popular tool, followed by PEAT, uh, HAMPAT, Striker GS, and Mutant. <coughs> We address research question three by studying the type of repositories importing mutation testing tools. We classify the GitHub projects into five main groups according to their purpose, research, teaching, development, learning, and extension. Um, um, as illustrated, almost half of the repositories under study are dedicated to development, followed by teaching, uh, learning, and research. But interesting, we observe an increase in the percentage of projects dedicated to development and a decrease in the number of teaching repositories when focused on tools found only in GitHub search. Uh, those tools are Hambat Infection, Mutmut, StrikerGS, and StrikerNet. On the contrary, mutation tools found in the literature only in the literature, major, Java, Mutant, Mutpy, and PIT, was uh, show the opposite behavior um, with a considerable reduction in the percentage of repositories dedicated to development and an increase up to double in the number of teaching repositories, uh, research, and learning repositories. <clears throat> This part seeks to, answer, uh, ans uh, seeks to answer research question four by studying the activity and relevance of the repositories importing the mutation testing tool under study. As illustrates, 41% of the repositories receive 10 or less than 10 commits, and 26% receive between 11 and 50 commits. This reflects a limited activity in the project importing mutation tools. <clears throat> Among other findings, we would like to mention that most of the projects with more than uh, 500 commits are classified as development. PIT, Infection, and Striker GS are the main mutation testing tool used uh, by these projects. <clears throat> Our result open new promising uh, research directions and provide a novel perspective on the use of mutation testing in the wild and show the potential of repository mining study to close the gap between research and practice. Um, among other many interesting findings, we would like to highlight that some of the uh, most widely used tools in GitHub are rarely found in research paper. This is the case of infection, Hambats uh, and, and HAPA for PHP and Strategy for JavaScript. And that is all. Thank you for your thank attention. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for your nice presentations. You're welcome. <laughs> Let's see whether any question from the audience. Okay. Anna, I'm interested in the kind of software target subject programs have you studied? Right. Whether there are some cases, certain mutation testing tool are more suitable for a certain type of software, maybe some other situation is more suitable for different kind of software. Well, uh, the subject of mutation testing tool that we use uh, were uh, based on first on research on the research literature. Uh, we found uh, evidence of use in uh, GitHub repositories of uh, 127 uh, research. Um, mutation testing tool found in the literature uh, research. And also we found um, mutation testing tool in the gray literature and also 
uh, looking for uh, GitHub repositories. Um, we obtain, um, uh, I don't remember the, the exact name, but uh, around 200 uh, mutation testing tools uh, as potential to, to study. Then we try to focus in the top 10 uh, mutation testing tool in order to, to, to um, uh, investigate uh, about the relevance, the, the, the features of this mutation testing tool and uh, about the, the use of, of them in research, in GitHub repositories. Yeah. So you said that one of, uh, Ed Geringer from NC State, you said that one of the most common uses was in education. Can you tell how it's being used in classes? How, how is mutation <laughs> testing used in, cla in uh, you know, software engineering classes? Uh, yes, well, uh, that detail is in, in our uh, research uh, paper. I don't remember exactly the details, but this is, was on, uh, one of the most uh, important uh, conclusions of our study. We observed an increase in the um, percentage of projects dedicated to development uh, and increasing teaching in the uh, mutation testing tool found in the HAD. And the mutation testing tools found in the literature does those are uh, major, Mujava, Mutant, Modpy, and PIT show the opposite behavior with a considerable reduction in the repository dedicated to development and um, more dedication to, to teaching, to learning, research. Um, but the details of <clears throat> all the, the projects uh, you can see in my, in my research paper. And if anyone wants more detail, I can contact to them in order to to, to, to try to give more information about that, because we, we publish our repositories with all the information that we extract, extract, extract it from, from all the repositories and, and mutation uh, yeah. testing tools. We have another question. Just one quick question. Um, yeah, I use mutation tools for Java quite a bit in various projects, but I don't think there's anything in the repository that would reflect that because it's just used as a tool to evaluate the tests. So presumably, or how do you detect the use of mutation tools? And presumably you're, you're perhaps underestimating the, the true use of some of the tools. <clears throat> well, I, it, this is just an, an study, um, and we all only study the, the GitHub repositories. Of course, there are other platforms where we can um, um, study the, the evidence of the use of all these mutation testing tools. We only focus on, on GitHub, and this is a threat to validity, of course, of our, of our work. Um, um, it's, it's, there are <laughs> possibilities that <clears throat> if we study in other platform like uh, GitLab or Bitpacker or in other platform, we can obtain uh, other um, information about that. Um, I would like to mention that this is a, a quantitative study of um, based on the use of mutation testing tools. Um, this is just a part of, of, of the study. Right now we are finished another study uh, based on the um, a qualitative study uh, in order to um, interview uh, the develop, uh, developers using those tools. Um, we uh, uh, have been um, obtaining more information about the use of, of this mutation testing tool and others. Um, I think that this new study can, can quite uh, increase the, the, the contribution of this one. So okay, part, thank you very much, yes, Anna. So we need to move on to thank the you. next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much. Okay. Um, yeah. So hi everyone, I'm Anjana Pereira. Today I'm going to present our paper, an experimental assessment of using theoretical defect predictors to guide search-based software testing, which was published in uh, Transactions on Software Engineering Journal. Uh, the authors of the paper are Dida, Burak, and Marcel. Search-based software testing techniques are very effective at achieving high code coverage, but is high code coverage alone sufficient to detect bugs effectively? For instance, Salahirad studied the bug detection performance of Eversuite, a state-of-the-art SBST tool, 
um, with different test goals. They found that the most effective test goal is branch coverage. Even with the most effective test goal, Eversuit could only detect 25% of the bugs on average with 10 minutes time budget for test generation. And there are defect predictors that they can estimate the areas in software projects that are likely to be buggy. We argue that we can use defect prediction to inform the SBSD techniques of the potential buggy methods in the code. So the SBSD techniques can focus the test generation on the parts of the program that are more likely to be buggy. So we hypothesize that we can improve the bug detection performance of SBSD by augmenting the coverage information used by SBSD with defect prediction information. We proposed predictive many objective sorting algorithm, or PREMOSA in short, which uses information from a defect predictor and focuses the search for testing the likely buggy methods to increase the chances of detecting bugs. PREMOSA takes as input a class with methods labels as buggy or non-buggy and outputs a test suite. PREMOSA has two main components. The first one, prioritize the targets based on defect prediction. So Premosa starts to search for test cases with the likely buggy targets, according to the defect predictor. This way it can prioritize the search efforts towards these targets. Defect predictors can incorrectly label actual buggy methods as non-buggy, which are called false negatives. So in order to handle these false negatives, Premosa starts searching for tests in likely non-buggy methods, uh, non-buggy targets, once it deems to have searched enough in the likely buggy targets. The second component is about the balanced test coverage. Uh, Premosa is more likely to keep generating test cases for more trivial targets, while non-trivial targets may receive less coverage. Uh, therefore, it may miss the bugs that are contained within the, the non-trivial targets. So the second component, which we call balanced test coverage, ensures non-trivial targets get a, get an, have an equal chance of being covered uh, compared to the targets that are easier to cover. We evaluate our approach in terms of uh, effectiveness in detecting bugs and also the efficiency of generating test cases that can detect bugs. To exper experimentally assess the uh, bug detection performance of Premosa uh, with an acceptable defect predictor, we simulated defect predictors with the, uh, the theoretical upper bound performance, uh, which is 100% recall and precision, and the theoretical lower bound performance, uh, which is 75% recall and precision. We can see that uh, both Premosa 100 and 75 uh, detect on average up to 16.4 more bugs than the state of the art Dynamosa. So we can say Premosa is significantly more effective than the state-of-the-art Dynamosa when using any acceptable defect predictor. Furthermore, the, the performance of Premosa doesn't decrease significantly when the ideal defect predictor is replaced by the most conservative defect predictor in the acceptable range. So we can confirm Premosa successfully handles false negatives in the predictions of defect predictors um, that are considered acceptable. We also find that Primosa is significantly more efficient than Dynamosa uh, compared to the state of the art so Dynamosa uh, with a, when using an any acceptable defect predictor. Moreover, um, as you can see in the figure, uh, Primosa 100 generates tests that can detect more bugs than Primosa 75 in the early stage of the search. After 60 seconds from the start of the search, these two converge, meaning that the difference between 75 and 100% is negligible. So in conclusion, we recommend practitioners to use method level defect prediction to guide the search process in SBSD in order to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of bug detection. When there is a reasonable large time budget, uh, our recommendation is to not to focus on improving the defect predictor performance beyond an acceptable level because it may not bring additional benefits. Otherwise, it is beneficial to further improve the defect predictor performance. Uh, finally, I would like to finish the presentation uh, with a summary that captures the key points from our research.
Thank you very much. Good timing and uh, nice slides. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, I would like to ask maybe some more challenging question, right? So it seems you are just using uh, defect 4G, but I think some people were saying the data set may be kind of obsolete and too small. And uh, like nowadays, the large language model try to use much more large uh, data sets, including the bugs, right? And also from different languages. Mm -hmm. So how do you think your approach may be generalizable to those larger data set from different languages? Um, good question. Um, so yeah, the external validity is also something that we discussed in the paper. Uh, the concepts, I would say, are applicable to other data sets. There's, there shouldn't be any limitation. So the able suite works with Java program language. So within that, it should be possible. Mike? Oh, so yeah. Um, we think that it should be possible. Java, yeah, but if you include the other programming languages, there could be constraints like because we, uh, the tool might use the ob object-oriented programming concept, so it has to be there. Okay. Uh, but the, the whole idea of using defect prediction to guide the the code, guide the uh, the coverage-based tools, uh, should be sort of transferable across the other languages. I see. Any other question from audience? Uh, maybe another technical sorry, my timer. <laughs> so uh, technical questions about your test case generation, right? How, how after you um, identify locations, how do you generate test case that can more likely go to that uh, location? Do you use a particular techniques to guide the generation of test cases? Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, again, a good question. So um, so we use the uh, Eversuite tool. So uh, and. Uh, so which has sort of the fitness functions defined such as the, the, the approach level, the branch distances. So we use the branch coverage as well. So yeah, See. so the, the fitness function. So it depends on the that. evil suite. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, I'm Simon. Um, I'm from Critical Systems Labs and we have Marsha here in the audience. She's from the University of Toronto. Um, this is a collaboration between our two organizations. So the context for this work is safety critical systems. These are systems where there's a loss to life or property or the environment that's intolerable and we have to mitigate hazards associated with these systems. And one of the established methods for doing this is by preparing what's called an assurance case. This is a structured argument that's supported by evidence that the system is acceptably safe. So one of the ways we can express assurance cases is using a notation called goal structuring notation. You may have seen this before. It's sort of a tree-like structure. And at the top of the tree, you put a claim, usually about a hazard being mitigated. And then you decompose that claim into subclaims and eventually support it by the evidence. This here on the slide is a very small fragment of a goal structuring notation argument. At Critical Systems Labs, we often build arguments that are hundreds or even thousands of nodes in size. Um, we use a tool called Socrates to do this. So these are complicated engineering artifacts. They're expensive to create and maintain. And we would really like researchers to be able to contribute um, and develop new methods for uh, maintaining assurance cases. But we have a problem which is that they're proprietary. Companies put very sensitive information into their assurance cases, intellectual property, and they don't just post this on their Facebook page. You can't just download it and, and use it for research. So um, w what do we do? Well, the idea in this paper was to rethink assurance cases rather than treating them as artifacts that we submit to a regulator for review, we would like to treat them as data that we can learn from. We can monitor the development through tooling, and then we can learn patterns of behavior of the developers. So the framework that goes along with the paper has sort of three parts. Now, of course, there's a safety engineer preparing the arguments, but then what we would like to do is use tooling to monitor the safety engineer's behavior and then learn patterns of their behavior and then make recommendations back to the user. So in the monitoring step, what we do is we record every act action that that user makes in a tool and we generate an event log. 
And then we can analyze that event log and learn relationships. So suppose you have a node in the argument, let's say node number one, and then you often change that node alongside another node, maybe node number five. If those two nodes frequently change together, we can learn that pattern. And then, if, say, node number five changes in the future, we can make a recommendation to the user and say, hey, maybe you should go change node number one, too, because these two things have changed frequently together in the past. This is a change impact analysis solution, which is a big problem in the assurance case community right now. How do we do change impact analysis? So there's a direct benefit, of course, making recommendations to developers. But if we have this event log of data that we collect from a tool, we can do other things, like we can generate metrics and statistics. We can learn patterns of behavior that span across organizations and across developers. So there's a whole world of opportunity here if we reframe our thinking with assurance cases from an artifact to data that we can learn from. Now we've taken this idea and we've applied it in practice. Um, the CERN Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, you may be familiar with this, it's the really big particle physics experiment. Um, we were actually part of a team that developed an assurance case for this project, for the machine shutdown system. And we recorded the actions of the developers as they created the assurance case using that tool Socrates I mentioned earlier. And then we used a sequence prediction algorithm to try to predict the next action in the event log. And well, what did we, what were the results? So the, the prediction algorithm only returned if it was confident in the results, if it was confident in its prediction, and it returned in 64% of cases. Okay, it's not bad. But the accuracy, when we actually compared what was predicted to what the user actually did was 13%. Now that's not a, a great number, but when you compare it to random, if you just randomly predict, you see a difference. And what we're really excited about, this is the, the new idea and emerging results part, um, is that this means that there are real patterns we can learn from assurance case data. It's not just random, there's something we can learn here. So sort of validating our preliminary hypothesis. So of course, we'd like to improve the accuracy of our recommendation system of our prediction algorithm. But we'd like to think about doing that in some maybe interesting ways. Uh, there are formal semantics we can assign to goal structuring notation. We can take advantage of those. We'd like to expand this from outside a single organization and in a single developer and see if we can transfer models, prediction models across organizations. So thank you for your attention and uh, any questions? Thank you very much. Also, nice idea. By the way, this is a new idea of papers with re emerging results. So, yeah, it's reasonable. Maybe you haven't done the uh, large scale evaluation, right? Hopefully, the next Soon. step. Yes. <laughs> okay, any question from the audience? Oh, okay. So, uh, I have a question. So, your prediction algorithm is it based on the same data that you have in the model? Because it looks like this is the kind of problem an LLM would be really good at. Looking for these correlations that like to complete the gaps, and have you considered doing that kind of? Okay, so I mean, I'll answer first, and then maybe Marsha, do you want to take a crack at it? So, um, I, it's based on sort of let's say conventional machine learning, um, but I will say that a lot of the results for this paper came before November 2022. Before Chad, that's an important date we heard yesterday in the keynote. So, <laughs> yeah, I think there's an opportunity, Marsha. So the main problem with all assurance case work is there really aren't data on which to train anything. All of this data lives within safety critical companies, and they aren't being uh, published much. And so that is our kind of broad ongoing problem. A lot of things can be hung on top of an assurance case and you can do all sorts of things except nobody's sharing them. So clearly this tool uh, you know, is bad. They're probably a better one, but the absence of data is sort of the, the key problem here. So it's unclear what to train it on. Um, and you know, can we throw chat GPT on it? Probably, but I don't quite know why it would know any better than, than almost random because the data isn't available. Yeah, I'm also related to the data, right? It sounds like you try to record every kind of data. So can you be more specific? What kind of data you are really 
recording and how big is the data set? So the, the data set that was used um, for this, for the CERN project that we used, had 700, it was an event log. So you can imagine someone creates a node in the assurance case, that goes in the event log. Someone changes the text, that goes in the event log. Okay. There's uh, 784 actions in our preliminary data set. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Junan Kim. I'm going to present the paper, The Predictive Mutation Analysis by a Natural Language Channel in Source Code. Um, this, is, uh, this work is done with Zhu Yongzhen, Xin Hong, and Xin Yu, and it is published at TOSIM last year. So uh, let me begin with, uh, with highlighting some scalability machine mutation testing, which is mainly because we have so many mutants, and we have to learn the test suite against the generated mutants, and it costs a lot. So to deal with problem, we propose a new technique called CSHAT, which is based on the predictive approach. So our goal here is to predict the mutation result without learning the test. So here's our basic idea. Given the mutants and test, we want to learn the relationship between them. Um, specifically, we want to learn the relationship between mutants and the test that can kill those mutants. So we want to do this without learning the test. So we first extract some static features from mutants and tests, and then we try to relate these features using deep neural network. So let me briefly introduce what kind of features we have used. And these features are based on the um, a so-called natural language channel. It's kind of communication channel that specifies the, the program execution, but it is written in, in, in the source code, but as a natural language. So, so it's kind of uh, uh, names in the source code, like method, function, or identifiers. But we think that by using, by exploiting this natural language channel, we can characterize the mutants as well as the characterize the test. So our first uh, uh, feature for mutant is the source method name that contains those mutants. However, the mutants in the same method will have the same uh, name. So to distinguish them, we also use the tokens of the mutated statements like this, as well as the mutation operators. So next, uh, this is the test feature. As I mentioned, the test feature is also named. So you can see that the test case name or, or the test method name or test class name. So if you look at those uh, tokens, you can partially deduce that the, each functionality of the test. Uh, but it's, it's always partial, not exactly don't know. So maybe in, in the future, we can include more tokens like the uh, in the assertion statement in the test body to enhance the perf model performance. Okay, now we have a, a static features uh, from natural language channel, and then the next job is to relate these features using deep neural network. So here's our model architecture. You can see that in the above, uh, uh, there's uh, input features that I mentioned, and then there's uh, several layers like embedding, GRU, and comparison. And at the end of the model, you can see that the softmax layer, which is uh, which means that we are going to uh, solve the binary classification problem that predicts whether the mutant is killed by the given test or not. So here's uh, our uh, evaluation scenario. We assume that there's a base version, that we already have done the mutation analysis in, in advance, and then we also have collected the static features that I mentioned, and then we trained the model at that time. And let's say we, uh, 207 days later, we have the target version that we want to do a mutation analysis on that version, but uh, with a small cost. So what we have to do is just collect the static features and then just do the model inference, then we can finally uh, get the predictive mutation measured. So we have a, in total six such questions, but I wanna show the two of them. The first one is the effectiveness of the, our technique. So, and as I mentioned, uh, this is a binary classification problem. So if you look at the plot and the y-axis is the F1 score, so higher is better, and the blue dots are our approach, and other ones are the previous work. And you can see that our, uh, our the performance was the best, and the average Japan score was about 0 0.8. Uh, I think this leads us to support that our uh, new static features using natural language channel are quite effective in predicting and learning the mutation legend. And uh, the second uh, research question is about efficiency because you know our, our technique is kind of trade uh, trade off between the cost and the accuracy of the mutation legend. Because as I mentioned, this is a, a predictive approach, so there can be a misprediction of the legend. So we want to see the 
some kind of speed ups and the, the, the execution times of learning our technique compared to the, the traditional mutation techniques like major and pit. And the results showed that our technique was about 68 times faster than major and about 14 times faster than PIT. And uh, yeah, that's it for the, my presentation. And I, I think I may miss many details, so please refer to my uh, the paper up there. And yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's also we're in time. We have uh, two minutes for questions. Thank you for. Uh, the work in the presentation. Uh, I have a question. Did you consider using your approach as a technique to select mutants? Select mutant. So you mean a sort of a prioritization? Yeah, to of prioritize the mutants. The, the mutants to test or just to to select some of them. Actually, I did not apply such uh, application in, in this work, but. Uh, because maybe one, one yeah. idea could be just you know you, you know what test should kill the mutant right yes, so you, yes. you execute one test for each mutant mm -hmm. and if that test doesn't kill the mutant then you can consider the, the mutant as alive yeah so and that yeah, live speed mutants up a lot, very, a lot the, very good for developers so we can classify some very easy to kill mutants and hard to kill mutants I think that is very possible direction so yeah I think that's that's a very good question then. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, so my question is, it, it's very impressive to see the, the, the accuracy has been improved compared to the existing like state of the art, but still we do have some kind of mis predictions. So I was wondering whether, uh, you know, did you happen to have any tendency or some kind of patterns where certain types of mutants are not predicted well, something like that? Uh, well, um, thank you for the question. But uh, I don't remember exactly, but um, in case, as, as far as I remember, if the method is very large, then the mutant feature, for example, uh, as I mentioned, this the, mutant, uh, the source method name has always the same for the all the mutants in the same method. So if the method is quite large, maybe more than 100 line of code, then uh, our, our model uh, is it's very hard for our model to distinguish them. So I think the kind of uh, the mutants in that larger uh, method or sometimes the uh, mutants in the very specific uh, if, if condition is, is sometimes very hard to detect, I mean, uh, know the each prediction lizard. So, yeah, the kind of mutants uh, was very d difficult for us. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I'm just curious, right? Just a previous slide, you showed that the function names, those test case names, is, uh, because you are just using Java, which may be more yeah. both, right? What about the C or other language, right? It's very brief. Um, actually, I don't know about uh, the C programs because our, our experiment is about it uh, only on the Java programs. But the, I think the problem is not dependent on the languages because right. the problem can be from the the wrong method name or inappropriate method names by the developers. Sometimes developers just write down the mole names or, or some kind of meaningless name. So if some programs is written like that, I mean, it cannot be, it is hard to be I mean, maintained, then our technique would not work well. But uh, answer to your question is that our technique is not that dependent on the another languages, so it, it would be fine, I okay, think. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. If that's no more function, that's all. Thank you again. Thank you all the speakers. Yeah, enjoy your rest of the conferences.